Hello everyone and welcome back to the second part of my Summit War Saga review. Now today we are going to cover Marineford and the events of the post-war arc because I wanted to kind of separate them into two. There was so much to talk about that I thought the previous video was going to drag on for a long time and to be honest I believe that Marineford is the pin pinnacle not in terms of necessarily quality to be fair because I think there are arcs that are as good or better than Marineford but I think it's the pinnacle in terms of events that need to be talked about in detail so I thought that it deserved its own video. Now I'm going to get pretty much straight into it but before I do I'm going to ask if you could leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel it would mean a whole lot and let's get cracked right into this arc. Now let me start off by saying that this arc's fucking unbelievable. It is generally brilliant. However, I am watching the anime, and therefore I only have my viewing experience from the anime to comment on. I have not read the manga, I don't know if the arc is better in the manga. And from my experience, I find personally the first half of this arc incredibly slow. Genuinely. I know a lot of people are going to hate that take, but I'm being 100% honest. From the moment the war starts, to the moment that Whitebeard officially engages in the fight, in my opinion it's quite boring and genuinely uneventful. But after that, wow. It really turns into complete fucking chaos. Like actual chaos. There's one plot point that's brilliant and changes the entire course of the story that happens before the introduction of Whitebeard into the fight. And that, of course, is the reveal of Ace and the fact that he is Goldie Rogers' son. Meaning that all along, him and Luffy have not been blood brothers and he is the only remaining survivor in Rogers' bloodline, which gives the significance to his execution, of course, a lot more value. Now, to us, not really, because Luffy just wants to save his brother. But to the world, this is a massive deal and makes Ace's death something that they feel needs to happen. Because after Ace's death, the bloodline of Goldie Roger is officially dead. Now, I believe that this is unbelievably fantastic. Like, I can't even really put it into words how great this reveal is. Because I did not expect it whatsoever. But I also love something about it, and that is the fact that Luffy doesn't care, and he, he knew this since he was a young boy, and it isn't something that's like, it kind of ruins their relationship or anything. The, the very much point of Ace and Luffy's relationship, which we come to know at the end of this arc, and the post-war arc, is that just because you have, you know, that just because people are not blood, you can love them like family, treat them like brothers, and have them as brothers. Or any, you know, sisters or whatever it might be. Uh, the blood it doesn't need to be the most important thing. It's about the bond that you create with these people. And I think that's beautiful. And it, we didn't know this up to this point. Of course, we thought that Luffy and Ace were bro blood brothers. I mean, listen, they look so similar. Uh, who would not think that Ace and Luffy are, you know, not bro blood brothers? It would be stunning to even think that before this arc. But it's true. But on to the next part of the story because in my opinion the story is pretty boring apart from that point up to when Whitebeard engages and that's what we're going to talk about next. Whitebeard showing off his powers is so cool. It's amazing. He can wipe out teams of navy soldiers with literally a swipe of the air with whatever his weapon is and his major attacks, his you know the big ones that he kind of creates that takes a wee bit of time they can nearly destroy the entire navy headquarters as we see towards the end of the arc now luffy is in my opinion the equivalent of a ufc fighter being essentially out on their feet being knocked out but fighting on instinct anyway not really awake but fighting entirely based on their instincts because they can't give up their brain doesn't let them Luffy, at this point of the story, is completely shot. He has no energy left whatsoever and has to rely on Ivankov's energy hormone ability to keep him alive, meaning that it's essentially fake energy that he's burning. He has absolutely nothing left. And speaking of the fake energy boost, he receives it and instantly runs into Kobe, which, of course, for us is a huge moment. We last seen Kobe in the post-Enny's lobby arc, but 
that was just a small interaction. The, ma the main plot point that we last seen Kobe in was literally back in Romance Dawn in episode one of the anime or chapter what three or whatever it was of the manga. Kobe is a lot stronger now. He's learned through Garp the CP9 abilities. I don't know what the official name for him is, but like finger pistol, shave, iron body, you know, those sort of things. Um, he's learnt them, but it's not enough against Luffy. Luffy has that mental lamp because, of course, he's trying to rescue Ace, and he one-shots Kobe. He embarrasses, uh, embarrasses him sorry, and knocks him completely out cold. Now, Luffy has an amazing moment in this arc, and that is using Haki subconsciously. He uses Haki, which, again, we don't know a whole lot about right now, but we know that people can be born with it and people can train to accomplish it. Um, but he stops Ace's execution by screaming, don't do it. He knocks everybody out and they can't execute Ace. It's mental, I don't understand it, and I, I can't wait to find out more. But it is such a good moment, and this moment opens up the door to the rescue of his brother. Garp's interactions with both Ace and Luffy in this arc are heartbreaking. Essentially, Garp is just a granddad who is torn between his morals as a human being, and obviously th they play into his work because he cares about justice and doing the right thing and stopping pirates and stuff like that. But of course, he's devastated over overseeing his grandchildren in such an awful situation. Of course, that leads up to the moment where Luffy confronts Garp saying that he can't attack his own granddad, but it then being Garp to take the hit because he couldn't bring himself to attack his family. One of the best moments in One Piece, in my opinion. Absolutely pulls at the heartstrings, let's say that. It's just a beautiful moment that really just shows an incredible amount of humanity, and that isn't shown a whole lot in One Piece. One Piece feels very... I suppose it doesn't feel very fake, but sometimes some just wild shit happens that is just obviously befitting of a shonen series, but this is very, very human from Garp, Ace, and Luffy. Now, we have to get into the writing on the back end of this arc, because this is where the chaos truly ensues. Oda baits the entire fan base twice, and one of them is truly hilarious. It feels like Luffy's finally reached Ace, because he has, he, he gets up the scaffold and finally gets to Ace, Ace's platform after what feels like <laughs> unlimited amount of time spent running towards him, but he can't set him free, which feels like the moment where Ace's fate is essentially confirmed, because the key is broken by Kizaru, uh, I think it's Kizaru, yeah it is Kizaru, and then uh, it looks like Mr. Three loses uh, the candle key that he made for Luffy as well. So it looks like Ace is not going to be freed. But the moment where Ace is revealed to have been free because his fire powers are awoken is absolutely unbelievable. It is so incredibly hype. It's a brilliant moment. And the realisation that he's been set free is such a fantastic feeling as well. Ace's words after being freed as well. So beautiful. After saying he felt so happy that his family and friends are all there to fight for him. That he was uncontrollably sobbing up on the stage thinking that he was about to die. As essentially he found out that people care about him. And it, that made him genuinely so happy. And listen, this moment is fantastic. They fight alongside each other for a while. Um, and it's great. But... Again, the second bit that I was talking about takes place, and this one is the opposite of being funny or interesting in terms of being like comedic or whatever it might be. Um, this is one of the saddest moments I have ever experienced in anime or manga. Um, I, like I said, he, he baited the fan base. Oda is an absolute dick, pretty much. He delivers the most harrowing moment in the entire series, by far. As, of course, Ace is freed, but ends up sacrificing himself anyway to save Luffy's life, as Akainu was about to kill him, leaving himself to die in his brother's arms with a smile on his face, saying that he was proud of the way that he lived, before, again, like I said, dying in a bloody mess in Luffy's arms. 
it felt like genuinely within 20 minutes we went from smiling at the free and of ace and the brothers fighting alongside each other to uncontrollably sobbing i'll be honest as luffy lost his brother and had his brother die in his arms it is truly heartbreaking sobbing um just after that as luffy goes into complete shock and passes out from the events of ace's death jimbe has to save him and as luffy exits the battle blackbeard enter enters it now this is where we kind of find out the master plot of blackbeard Blackbeard has essentially manipulated everybody. He revealed the plan which was to gain the title of Warlord by capturing Ace, which of course he did, which by the way means that Blackbeard was responsible for Ace's death, so that he can get into Impel Down with no issue. That's the only reason he wanted to become a Warlord of the Sea, just so that he could enter level 6 and free some of the worst criminals in the world to join his new crew, the Blackbeard Pirates. This signals the beginning of a new pirate era in One Piece, as Blackbeard kills his former boss Whitebeard, and as Whitebeard dies standing up, an episode or two after Ace dies, the crew is left in disarray, talking about the Whitebeard Pirates of course, and the victory of the Navy is confirmed. However, there's a massive factor in these events that even though everything's sad and gloomy and full of despair to be fair, um, this moment changes the world forever. And just before he died, Whitebeard screamed the words, the One Piece is real. An incredible moment, a massive moment. Sabaudi, everybody in Sabaudi were watching it on the transponder snails so they could see this moment happen. It was broadcast all over the world and because of this, it has spawned a new pirate era that we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, in terms of the very end of the war, of course, we just had two bombshell moments where Ace dies, Whitebeard dies, and Blackbeard does the unthinkable by revealing his grand master plan. And as soon as that happens, Shanks appears. Just when we thought the chaos was over, Shanks appears out of nowhere with the intention of ending the war, saving Kobe from Akainu in the process, as he tried to stop the war with a speech to, of course, no avail, and picking up the straw hat as well, as a callback to, of course, the very first chapter of the series. Poetic in more than one way, as Luffy wasn't able to interact with him whilst Trafalgar Law was saving his life through surgery, although Shanks made sure that Luffy got the straw hat back. Marineford officially ends with two major deaths, Port Gas D Ace and Whitebeard. The first two major deaths in the series, which again was a massive shock to me. A Luffy left on the verge of death, none of the crew in sight, and a major victory in a war for the Navy. A slow start for the arc that turned into complete and utter chaos in the anime anyway. And some of the most entertaining One Piece that has ever happened, partnered with some of the most devastating anime that I've ever experienced. It is a truly masterful experience. Now, I can't mention the end of Marine Ford without talking about Blackbeard uh, in a little bit more detail. And I'm talking about his powers. Now, we know that Blackbeard ate the dark, dark fruit and therefore is able to control darkness and can use vortexes and black holes. He is one of the strongest uh, pirates in the world as it is. However, after the death of Whitebeard, Blackbeard does something, I don't know what he does, but he enacts his plan and steals Whitebeard's powers, meaning that his left hand contains Whitebeard's powers and Blackbeard's right hand contains his powers the dark dark fruit powers meaning that he has two devil fruit powers the only pirate in history to have them and it clearly makes the statement that in the story currently blackbeard is 100 percent the strongest character in the world now marine ford again an absolute masterpiece but i feel like i need to talk about the post-war arc as well and i don't want this video to go on for too long this arc took me massively by surprise. I thought it was going to be a wind down and I thought maybe a training arc was going to be introduced for Luffy which would then take him away for two years, which to be fair does happen, but that is not the main focal point of this arc whatsoever. 
as soon as the war ends, we get some news kind of reports that tell us that the world is essentially crumbling. The narrator tells us that Whitebeard's final words have spurred on the next era of pirates, with thousands of new pirates setting out to sea and chaos has ensued, a lot of them taking the wrong route in terms of gaining power as a pirate, destroying towns in horrible ways and ruining people's lives. Of course, not the way that the pirates that we know, that we want to support, go about it, but some of them are just horrible bastards at the end of the day, aren't they? Trafalgar Law has been able to transport Luffy to Amazon Lily alongside Hancock. And as he awakens and starts to realise what just happened, he has a breakdown and begins to reminisce on Ace's life, which starts the backstory arc. Now, I did not expect in the slightest for us to have a backstory that goes into this much detail surrounding Luffy and Ace's childhood and Luffy's life in general. We pretty much know everything now. Um, learning how Ace interacted with Luffy as a child and how he warmed up to Luffy through his persistence, which is somewhat fitting of Luffy's character, I suppose, is great. Luffy's so different as a kid, and it's really weird to see. He's a really sensitive child who is somewhat of a crybaby and shies away from any sort of fight or scary event at all as he starts crying and shouting about how he doesn't want to die and how he's scared that he's going to die. God, how times have changed, because Luffy is so incredibly different to that now. Um, unbelievably, we learned that the entire time there was a third brother. We had Luffy, we had Ace, and the third brother, Sabo, who is a fascinating character who grew up in a royal family, but grew to hate his family due to the way that they acted, and he just disagreed with essentially everything they'd done, and he was desperate to live a life of freedom by taking to the sea before he was old enough to become a full noble. Ace, Luffy and Sabo spend every single day together and build such a tight bond, but unfortunately, through the actions of a celestial dragon, Sabo's ship is blown up as he's setting out ahead of Ace and Luffy, and he supposedly dies, although I'm convinced that we'll see him again. But regardless, this left them both absolutely destroyed, and this is the major moment of the arc. Ace vowed to protect Luffy for his entire life, and promised that he'd never die, which Luffy took literally and believed. It is so fucking sad, man. It makes everything feel so much sadder than it already did. Putting everything into perspective like that through a backstory was the perfect way to do it, and I respect it so much from Oda's point of view. Luffy and Ace then spent the next seven years training relentlessly together until Ace set out to sea at 17, Luffy obviously having to wait three more years before he could. They both trained each other so hard and became incredibly strong, making the fact that Luffy was so strong at the start of the series make so much sense. Now, that's how the, the flashback arc wraps up, but we learn about Luffy's house, being the, he spent time with the Dadan family, which is how he obviously met Ace, and we learnt that Luffy, when he was like seven, was, he, he was a, a gum person, he was, you know, he was uh, made of rubber at that point, but he was so useless, he couldn't use any of the abilities, pistol was not even a, a thought that was possible at all. Now, as we kind of see him at 14, he is a lot stronger. He can use Pistol and Gatlin and stuff like that to a perfect level, which is great. But of course, at 17, he is even stronger. And we see all of that in obviously part one of the series. But I love the fact that the first half of the series wraps up with a flashback arc. Because again, it feels like we've kind of seen everything that leads Luffy up to this point in his life. And now we get to see the next chapter through a two-year time skip. Jimbei calls back to the conversation with Ace in the cell in Impel Down, which is what I was talking about earlier, where Ace said that he seen Luffy in Alabasta, um, and when he seen Luffy, it made him so happy because he no longer represented that persistent kid who would chase him around every day and could never find him. He'd found his own crew, his own family, to the point where he was confident that Luffy would survive no matter what. Again, given the backstory, it makes the entire thing so much more emotional and gives Jimbei's role in Luffy's life a lot more meaning. 
as Jimbe tells Luffy to focus on what he still has in terms of dwelling on what he's lost, Luffy remembers that he still has that family by way of his crew and shifts his mindset to finding them again because, of course, we don't see them. We, we don't know where they are. Well, we know where they are, but Luffy definitely doesn't. Uh, as that happens, we shift towards the time skip, where the Straw Hats will rendezvous in Sabaudi in two years' time after Luffy has gained the strength to be able to enter the new world and essentially stand a chance. I can't wait to see them all again, because even though these last few arcs have been genuinely incredible and some of the best episodes One Piece has offered so far, the Straw Hats are the heart and soul of this series, and it's going to be great to see the adventure continue. That was the review. Thank you so much for watching it. I thoroughly enjoyed recording and scripting this video. It was fantastic. I'm going to rank all five of the Summit War Saga arcs and rank every saga in One Piece so far. Obviously, the, the, the first half of the series because the next video that you will see, it'll be the first saga review of the time skip. So, my least favourite arc in the Summit War Saga is like I said, impel down. Um, I think it's really good, but I just feel like a lot of it doesn't need to really be there. It could be a lot shorter than it is. And I suppose the, the whole point of Luffy taking such a long time and going through so much adversity in impel down, just to do it all essentially for nothing and to go to Mar Marine Ford in an extremely weakened state anyway, is quite a frustrating thing because if Luffy had fought at full power in, in Marine Ford, then you just never know what would have happened. But yeah, Impel Down is probably my least favourite. I would then go to probably the Amazon Lily arc. And again, these are all incredible arcs. I love Amazon Lily. Um, it's pretty much perfect, but it's not as good as the third spot, which is the post-war arc. Now, again, I think that the backstory for Luffy and Ace is masterful. It's brilliant. It puts so much into perspective. And I think it's just beautiful i think it's fantastic and it opens up a potential let's just say a potential um re-emergence of sabo in the future because i do not think he's dead i really don't I, unless you see someone die in this show they're not dead that is the rule that i've got um yeah so post-war war is uh, number three number two i would go with marine ford i think um again an incredible arc fantastic the chaos is incredible but i just think the slow nature of the start of it kind of pegs it back a little bit in the ranking and because it's perfect from beginning to end number one on the list would be sabaudi i think sabaudi is incredible and i think it is possibly my favorite arc in one piece even maybe better than any's lobby but that is very close but yeah an incredible saga and i will rank all of the sagas so far in the series, the, every saga in part one of One Piece. The worst one, by far, is Thriller Bark. That is not even a competition. It, so much of it feels like filler. It's so, it's so mid. It's so average. It's just, ugh, not a fan. After that would be the Sky Island or Sky Pier saga, which I think is cool, but just pretty slow in the middle of it, to be honest. I think it ends great, but the middle portion and the start of it aren't fantastic next would be alabasta again love it but just think that there's a little snag that holds it back from being as good as the next entrance which would be east blue i love east blue so much and as time goes on i grow fonder of it i think the introductions of all the characters are fantastic and knowing how much we know now about those characters it just feels so significant and such a such a, just a lovely thing to look back on. Um, next up would be my number two slot, which is Water 7. I think it's fantastic. Um, I think Ennis Lobby is one of the best arcs. However, if you're looking at it from an overall perspective, you've got to say that it's less consistent than the Summit War because Long Ring Longland exists in that saga. It's just a fact. And although Water 7 and Ennis Lobby make it one of the greatest things I've ever seen, Long Ring Longland is frustrating, let's be honest. Um, so yeah, it would be number two. And number one would be the Summit War. I think the 
uh, consistency of how great these arcs are is unbelievable and incredibly tough to find anywhere else inside part one of the series and I just loved it so so much and I can't wait to see what happens once we see the Straw Hats again in two years time. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for watching it. I genuinely appreciate it a ton. I'm going to leave a couple of One Piece videos on the screen. One will certainly be part one of this review, which covered Amazon Lily, Impel Down and Sabaudi. Um, if you would be interested in leaving a like on the video, subscribing to the channel and hitting that naughty bell as well, it would mean the world to me. Thank you so much for watching. Roll on the time skip and goodbye.